All right, it's a real pleasure to have Dave Snowden over here. It's a dream come true for me. Uh, I've been trying to get Dave Snowden maybe for six years now, and finally we have him here. I first uh, saw his keynote in 2007 in Limerick, Ireland, and uh, probably till date, I think that was one of the best keynotes I've ever seen. I was literally at the edge of my seat throughout the keynote. Uh, I'm sure you're gonna get the same experience today. He speaks really fast, so you have to be attentive. Don't do multitasking while he's speaking. You will get his jokes 10 minutes later otherwise. <laughs> All right, with that, I'm going to call Dave Snowden. Thanks a lot for coming, Dave. So Limerick was interesting. It was the, only the second Agile conference I'd done. In fact, it was the first, because I did an XP event in London. And having spent most of my early life in IT, I was one of the founders of DSDM, etc and then moved into general management, it was rather odd to come back in and discover that the Canaveran framework, which is designed for leadership development and corporate strategy, had been picked up in my old area of development, IIT. So for the last four or five years, I've have been having a thoroughly enjoyable time of plunging back into project management in large IT projects and doing things I thought I'd abandoned early on in my career and coming back. So I, you, you should hopefully get a bit more reflective wisdom now than you did in Limerick. Um, the general title for what the stuff I do and other people do is called sense making. There are various definitions of that. I define it as how do we make sense of the world so that we can act in it. Now with that comes the concept of sufficiency. Yet you can never know everything you need to know. So how do you know when you know enough? And what sort of actions can you do based on what you actually know? Uh, and really everything falls back to that as we move through. And one of the key lessons of this, and this is really important for those of you who are focusing on simplistic recipes, <clears throat> and this is from uh, Gaping Void. If you don't know Gaping Void, brilliant cartoonist. Uh, you can go onto his website, and one of these cartoons comes down into your email every day. If it wasn't for that and Dilbert, I think I'd go quietly insane, all right? They, they keep me going. Right? Um, but this makes a really important point. Yeah, all paths up are different. All paths down are the same. So the idea that somebody can give you a recipe which will mean that you will succeed is just fundamentally flawed. All the people I hear speaking at keynotes, whether they're companies talking about changing markets or people talking about radical new methods for Agile, have actually not copied what somebody else has done. They've done something radically different and they've changed the space. Yeah, and that's really important to understand. Yeah, the, I can give you a recipe for failure. Uh, and the recipe for, pay, for failure is repeating past mistakes. Come back to something I said briefly on day one. Yeah, people are arguing that some of the scalable frameworks are necessary because it's the only way to get adoption of Agile within the company. Well, if you get people to adopt Agile without understanding Agile, you're just dooming yourself to another IT failure. Yeah, it may give you a temporary satisfaction of suddenly getting budget, but downstream the expectations won't match the delivery and you're back into a more traditional mold of IT. So there are times when you have to get it right up front and maturity and wisdom is about knowing when that's the case and not taking a simplistic route. And I'm going to make a big difference between being simplistic and being simple. Uh, and that, that's an important distinction. So what I want to do is to introduce some of the basic concepts around complexity. I'll do around that around the Kinevin framework. Can I just do a quick check? How many people have heard the children's party story? Oh, good, a naive audience, right? Okay, you'll get it. those who have, you'll get a live performance, all right? So now I know I can use that one. Um, after that, I'm going to go through two areas of development where we're working now actively within Cognitive Edge. Um, one is looking at the whole area of how we change the area of requirements capture and how we move into a continuous feedback loop um, between requirements capture, software testing, and really move into a much earlier stage of understanding users. Uh, if we go back to some of the, you know, just great stuff yesterday about the number of failures that you see, um, I want to be slightly different on that. I think, okay, so 80% or 90% of what we do fails. I've heard that from people who've got lots of experience. I don't want to just accept that. I actually think we need to move learning much earlier into the cycle. I think the reason we have that amount of failure is we wait too long before we start actually interacting with users in development. So I don't want to take those failure figures. I want to talk about learning early to fail less. Yeah? And I'm going to talk about different methods for engagement for that. And I'm going to give you a very brief insight, but not much detail, 
into some of the new complexity approaches we're now adopting to large-scale IT project management, uh, which actually recognize the value of waterfall. Uh, I famously once said that uh, safe is Prince 2 in agile clothing, uh, with a deliberate reference to wolves and sheeps. All right? um, fundamentally, I'm now working with the Prince 2 community because we actually think we need to start to resurrect some of that material, but actually understand its interaction with Agile. Because there's a large amount of IT project management where somewhere with the discipline of Prince actually has application. Yeah? It's just we need to know its boundaries. And that concept of boundaries is going to be key to what I talk about. If people understand that you understand boundaries, you're using the right methods in the right places, then you're going to scale to all sorts of levels without a problem. If you're going with missionary statements about if we just adopt this and have everybody certified in the next six months, life, the universe, and everything will be wonderful, then sorry, you're going to fail again. Yeah? Yeah, differentiated approaches are key. So let's move on to Kinevin. Uh, Kinevin is a Welsh word. Um, it's pronounced Kinevin. Um, it means, in Welsh, it doesn't mean habitat. That's an English phrase. Uh, the English don't have an equivalent. Many of you will know I'm Welsh, so defining ourselves as not being English is key. All right? that's, that's part of our national psyche. Um, in Welsh, it means the place of your multiple belongings. It's a sense of being rooted in many different pasts, which profoundly influence what you are, but of which you can only ever be partially aware. Yeah, so it's a very good name for a complexity model because that's the reality of life. You're in a flow of meaning over time. Yeah, at any one point in time, you can act in that time, but you do it hugely influenced by factors from the past of which you can never be aware. That's true of your users, it's true of your C-level executives, it's true of everything. Everything is about flow, it's not about static assessment. And there's going to be a lot of lessons about moving to flow dynamics and away from static linear approaches. So Kinevin works off some basic science. Uh, what myself and my own group in IBM decided to do almost 20 years ago now is that social science was in a very bad place. Now, I knew that already. My first degree is a joint honors between physics and chemistry. Sorry, between physics and philosophy. Um, so I was taught to despise social science from two completely different disciplines, and that really hasn't gone away since. Um, so we decided to go back to complexity science, to cognitive neuroscience, to the biological end of anthropology, and say, what do we now know about systems and people and decision making? And let's actually reapply that into social systems um, rather than actually try and build on what is actually a fairly perverse discipline, yeah, which makes wrong assumptions. Right? So that's where it comes from. So within, within that basic science of systems, we can identify three different types of system. Um, effectively, ordered systems, complex systems, and chaotic systems. Now, I should be clear at this point that there is no full conformity of use of language in the field. Yeah, physicists use complexity and chaos differently from social scientists, different from chemists, different from biologists. So if anybody wants to say that's not chaos, that's randomness, yeah, okay, I agree. I'm not going to get fussed about that. Yeah, in the disciplines I come from, that's what we call chaos. Other people call it randomness. I'm going to define my terms, right? It will take another 20 years before the field settles down. Yeah, that's the nature of new things. So I use a constraint-based definition, which comes from Gerardo and others, and as further developed by myself. And basically, what I'm arguing is that a highly constrained system is what we call ordered. The level of the constraints are such that there are no freedom of movement. You, you can't actually escape the constraints. They contain all behavior. Now, that type of system is unique to humans. We're really good at it, and it has huge value. Uh, these days, we count the number of surgical instruments left at the end of an operation and do a checklist procedure to check it's the same as we're there at the start. Yeah, as I get older, I think this sort of thing is of increasing importance. Uh, I know the figures for the percentage of surgical instruments left in people's bodies before that was instituted, and it's a really scary percentage. Yeah? So we're good at that sort of stuff, but we don't understand that it's deeply contextual. Um, highly disciplined, controlled checklist procedures only seem to work for human beings in highly ritualized environments. So in an operating theater, the process of scrubbing up changes the way you think. Now, I've been into an operating theater as an observer twice. Yeah? Uh, both my children were, to quote Shakespeare, from their mother's tomb untimely ripped. And I've now decided that caesareans are wonderful from the father's perspective. Uh, you get to see a fascinating operation. You get to see the baby first, and you get to hold it first. So I'm all in favor of them, all right? 
Um, but that process of going through washing your hands, cleaning yourself, putting on the white boots and everything, you actually think differently at the end of that process. And that's actually what ritual does in human systems. Uh, a ritual entry into a highly, a highly role-based process means that you will follow rules that you would never follow as an individual person. And you can see that massive compliance with hygiene in operating theaters, low compliance with hygiene in wards where people aren't ritualized into the role. And there's a body work I'm not going to talk about today that we're doing, for example, to ritualize entry from development into software testing. Literally, if you get people to change their clothes, you will improve their behavior as a tester. Yeah, because actually that ritual entry by changing a costume changes the cognitive activation patterns of the brain. Now, I say there's a lot of depth in this. I'm giving you some hints of things. But order has value, but realize the context. The danger is that we apply it where it shouldn't apply. And one of the many advantages of working for IBM for seven years, I hasten to add, I didn't volunteer. I was conscripted. And I was the only person in the history of IBM to last seven years without filling out a timesheet. I'm still proud of that achievement. All right? It was an act of continuous petty defiance, all right? but it mattered. Right? Um, is that you learn everything there is to know about excessively constrained systems. I mean, there's an underlying heuristic in IBM, don't buck the process. There's no point in arguing the process is wrong from a customer or a business perspective because you'll be killed. Uh, the only way to actually achieve customer satisfaction is to work around the rules. In fact, the whole secret of survival in IBM, and I doubt if it's changed since I left, is the ability to manage within a rule constraint system, which in many ways is perverse. So for example, when they banned us buying food for staff late at night, yeah, which they said was in, you know, we didn't need to do it, and if we did need to do it, why didn't we ask in advance? Well, if you could ask in advance, you wouldn't have to be buying food at 4 o'clock in the morning because the system's got to go live at 9 a.m. Yeah, they eventually made it impossible. So the practice emerged of over-tipping London taxi drivers so you got a blank receipt, filling out the blank receipt for the amount of food, yeah, submitting that receipt and getting your money back. Now, I made this reference at Scrum, the Scrum Alliance Conference in Berlin last year. Three people from IBM ran up and said, we're still doing that. Did you invent it? <laughs> and somebody from HR came up to me. And I knew her from HR and IBM. And she said, we knew you were doing that, but it was easier to let you carry on with it. Now, it won't take you long in any large organization to see similar patterns. You know, the obsession with order, the obsession with making things look superficially structured, means that actually the informal networks have to work beneath the surface to make apparently efficient, apparently efficient systems effective. Yeah. So the over-focus on efficiency, the over-focus on process, produces perverse results. And you can see that the same sort of thing in a lot of agile methods. We start off with an inspirational set of ideas yeah, from Snowbird, and it ends up getting to a structured, logical, ordered, linear process that people aren't allowed to escape from. And then those structured, ordered, linear processes are linked with other structured, lo loaded processes to the point where we get diagrams with so many bloody boxes and arrows. You know, the intention is to create dependency on the, the model creator rather than to create something people can actually use. You know, so order has value, but within limits. And the limits are actually much narrower than we think. You know? Chaotic systems, on the other hand, I'm defining as systems without constraints, which isn't the same thing as randomness. All right? and, still trying to find the right word for this. An unconstrained system is one where everything is operating independently of everything else in the context in which you're working. Now, that can be a catastrophic failure. Yeah, all of a sudden, all the old uncertainties, all the old certainties disappear. Yeah. Well, actually, that's only ever a transitionary state. If you ever have a crisis, within minutes, people start to impose constraints. And a big mistake people make when they use Kinevin is to assume chaos is a permanent state. Actually, it isn't. It's a transitionary state. Yeah, that's very important to realize. It's a transitionary domain. Uh, used deliberately, it has huge power. So for example, if you can remove all constraints, you can get huge novel innovations. But it takes a lot of energy to create a system without constraints. Yeah, constraints are natural to human systems. They'll come in place immediately. So if you genuinely want to make something truly innovative, you have to put a lot of management time and energy into keeping things apart and keeping them separate. Otherwise, they'll get killed. The other big use, and this is something we're working on heavily at the moment, is a variation of what's traditionally called wisdom of crowds, which is the ability to do whole of workforce engagement in real-time decision support. 
because if everybody assesses something independently of everybody else, and you look at the results graphically on the screen, you may recognize some lean concepts here. Yeah, is, is mass engagement, but visual representation to allow human beings to make decisions. Right? Fundamentally, that allows us to actually do real-time decision support under conditions of uncertainty. We're now starting experiments within Wales and potentially New Zealand and Nova Scotia, in what's called the Small Countries Project, to actually create citizen networks by which we can ask questions of entire populations in real time to inform government policy. Yeah. So once you start to understand the context of and lack of constraints, there's lots of fascinating things you can do with it, but it takes a lot of energy and a lot of structure. And then we move to complex adaptive systems. This is the day-to-day -day reality of most life. These are systems where you have what are called enabling constraints, constraints which actually to a part extent modify behavior, but behavior themselves modifies the constraints. So what actually happens is the constraints and behavior co-evolve, key phrase from biology. Yeah, as people interact with constraints and interact with each other, interact with tools, interact with systems, interact with their environment, the constraints are modified, the people are modified, the systems are modified, things are in constant flux or constant change. And one of the key things about co-evolution is it's associated with the concept of irreversibility. You can never go backwards. And anybody with teenage children knows about coevolution and irreversibility. Yeah, you can't actually say, let's actually do a level set, all right? Yeah, we, we got a real problem here, right? They're, they're 14 or 15. Anybody know the problem when they hit 14 or 15? Yeah, and there's things you really wish you hadn't done about 15 years ago. It was kind of like that was a mistake. I now realize it. Right? Um, you can't say, well, let's get in some management consultants and let's do a strategic reappraisal of our child rearing strategy. Uh, let's set key performance indicators, milestone targets. You know. Let, let's run a series of linear iterations to see if we can get this behavior right. right? You don't do that, do you? Right? Um, you've, got to be, you've got to need to be scared about this, by the way. I was in America recently and dis when I satirized this and discovered there are now consultants who will actually come into your family and create mission statements, value statements, KPIs, and learning objectives. So you know, this actually gets quite depressing, all right, when you think about it. Now, the reality is complexity is about inherent and continuous uncertainty, but it can be managed as a flow. It can't be managed as a static system. Yet we can all manage flow. Yet if you can ride a bicycle, you know if you try and slow down too much, it's a problem. If you speed up too much, it's a problem. But provided you keep the right speed, it's easier to maintain balance. Yet so think about ways in which you manage dynamic flow, and that's what complexity is about. Now, the key lesson on complexity, and this is something which is difficult for people to get, is a complex system is not causal. If you get that, I don't need to do anything else. But that's a really difficult for people trained in a Western tradition to understand. It's actually much easier from a Catholic or a Hindu or a Taoist tradition, because those religions have kept the concept of some things just are. Yeah, there's no reason for them to be, they just are. Yeah, whereas the Protestant tradition has got inherently causality built into it. The basic fact is a complex adaptive system has dispositions. At any one stage in time, it may, it's more likely to move in one direction than another direction, but it might perversely move in a completely unexpected direction. So it has dispositions, but not causality. Yet the same thing will only happen again the same way twice by accident, not by the inherent nature of the system. Technically, for the philosophers amongst you, it doesn't have linear material causality, yeah, but that's kind of like the most common understanding of causality yeah, in most, most management. Right? So you can't say, if I do this, I will get that result. Yeah? Complexity theory effectively a priori invalidates any method which says it can produce a defined result. Yeah? And that actually changes the game. If you have to manage with systems which are dispositional, you have to manage in a radically different way. You have to manage the evolutionary potential of the present moment in time and adjust as you go. Something hinted at by quite a few of the speakers yesterday. I now put in the theory on what people with practice already understand. This is actually a theory to back up common sense. Now, the best way I've ever learned to understand the differences is to think about organizing a party for a bunch of 
nine or 10 year old children, if you can all imagine, imagine this. And you're making the mistake of holding it in your own house. Right? This is an error. Right? You learn this pretty fast. Right? The reason of church halls and community centers yeah, are better venues for parties is they have fire hoses. Right? And fire hoses are very useful for cleaning up after the party and they're occasionally needed for crowd control during the event itself. Right? So yeah, I recommend the church hall. So let's look at how we'd manage the children's party dependent on what type of system it is. So if we assume the system is chaotic, that means the children are unconstrained, their behavior is random, which means they'll probably discover drugs and alcohol and go on a personal experience of self-discovery. Your house may burn down in the process, but all property is theft and it was socially constructed in the first place, so why are you worried about it? And there's a stiletto in that for some academic colleagues of mine. I don't recommend this method. I've got friends in California who've tried it, but never more than once. Yeah, the, the recovery cost is very high. Um, the order systems approach, on the other hand, you'll all understand if you've been on any of the popular certification courses. Right? Under this, you agree learning objectives to the party in advance of the party itself. You make sure that the learning objectives are aligned with the mission statement for education in the society to which you belong and are clearly articulated and printed off on motivational posters with pictures of eagles soaring over valleys and water dropping into ponds, and you put the posters around the room where you're going to hold the party. You then produce a project plan for the party. The project plan should have clear milestones throughout the party against which you can measure progress against ideal party outcome. The senior, ad senior adult should start the party with a motivational videotape. Yet you don't want the children wasting time in play which isn't aligned with the learning objectives of the party itself. And then the said senior adult should use PowerPoint to demonstrate their personal commitment to the party objectives and to demonstrate how the children's allowances are linked to the achievement of the milestone targets. Following the highly successful completion of the party, you conduct the after action review. Yeah. Um, you then identify improvements to best practice regimes, you mandate process improvements, and everything is wonderful. If, any, if, wrote, re, for, if for any remote reason the children aren't happy, then you hire an appreciative inquiry practitioner who will get them to tell happy, clappy stories so they have happy mental models and suitably indoctrinated, they'll like whatever you put in front of them next time. Everybody reasonably familiar with this approach to yeah, party management? Right? Yeah, it's a scalable approach to party management. I strongly recommend it. <laughs> On the other hand, the complex systems approach is much simpler. We start off by drawing a line in the sand, known as a boundary in complexity theory. And we look the children squarely in the eye and say, cross that, you little bastards, and you die. <laughs> One of the things you learn for pretty fast as an adult is the value of flexible negotiable boundaries because rigid boundaries have a habit of becoming brittle and breaking catastrophically. Yeah. We then introduce catalytic probes, a football, a video, a barbecue, I won't say a cricket ball because I understand national grief at the moment, all right? <laughs> With any comfort, we lost those bastards English at rugby this year as well, so I'm in a bad mood on that one. Right? It's, just, it's the same sort of phenomenon, all right? Um, fundamentally, what we do, I shouldn't go these down diversions, all right? We introduce things that kids may play with. And sometimes they play with them and sometimes they don't. If they do and it's a good thing, it's called an attractor and we amplify it. If they do and it's a bad thing, it's still called an attractor, but we do our best to disrupt it very quickly. Uh, that's where you use the fire hoses, all right? I remember the fire hoses, they're really important, all right? Um, what we're actually doing is effectively is managing the emergence, and this is a key phrase, beneficial coherence within attractors, within boundaries. And actually that phrase in the sequence is very important. You can't actually create an attractor, you can only catalyze it. But if you have catalyzed one and it's working, you amplify it. If it's not, you disrupt it. And boundaries you can manage in a more structured way. Now, I make no apology for using specialized language. Yeah, Heidegger famously said, man thinks he's a master of language, but language is the master of man. We know from a cognitive neuroscience point of view, if you don't change language, you don't change the way that people think. So people who refuse to learn new language have actually refused to change or to think, and that, that's very basic. Now, too far, it's jargon, but some change of language is key. So I'll try and keep it to a minimum, but the concept of catalysts, attractors, and boundaries is vital. 
Now, you should start to see why complexity is of huge importance to government. We're now, as I say, starting experiments with the new Center for Applied Complexity at the University of Bangor in Wales to actually do whole of country experiments. Because complexity offers us an alternative between the extremes of free market capitalism and state planning. It actually says if we put state resources into managing boundaries and creating attractors, locally contextual solutions can emerge at significantly lower cost than either of the current mechanisms. Yeah, the cost of free market capitalism is massive in terms of social deprivation and inequality. The cost of state planning is massive in terms of bureaucracy. There has to be a different method, and complexity gives us a science-based approach. But what I say about countries applies to companies as well. Yeah, complexity is a new approach to governance with multiple ramifications. It's a genuine paradigm shift in the way we think about the world. And it requires people to think differently, but therefore to act differently in terms of the way it works. That leads us on to Kinevin. Um, and in Kinevin, what we actually do is drawn like this, all right? So please do not draw it as a two by two matrix and call it quadrants. All right, it's a five domain model. You can't have five quadrants, all right? This is basic language, all right? Um, or don't draw it as a two by two matrix and put a diamond in the middle because you know I'll pick it up on Twitter and get irritated, all right? Sorry, I'm going about existing practice. It's drawn with, a, with five strokes of the pen. Yeah? And what it does is divides order into two, obvious and complicated. Now, this is an important distinction because in obvious order, right, um, everybody can see the relationship between cause and effect as a result of which everybody will go along with best practice. This is the only valid domain. It's not just that there's a linear relationship between cause and effect because the high level of constraint produces predictability, but I can apply rigid constraints because everybody buys into the solution. Right? And that's really important to understand because the personal buy-in is key to this working. Um, my favorite example of this, is you all know this, is civilized countries drive on the left-hand side of the road. Uh, Sweden decided in the 60s to stop being civilized and become uncivilized, and they all moved over from the left to the right. It was quite hysterical. Right? I, mean, I remember seeing it when I was a kid on the television. But it was the right thing to do because all the countries around them yeah, drove on the right. Now, I realize in Italy and India, this doesn't apply. Right? There's a whole different yeah, driver behavior in, in, in Italy and India is actually mathematically predictable based on flocking, flocking algorithms. So, you know, there, there are different models that you can work from. All right? But the point is, you know, in the UK, we decided to drive on the left. Now, once you've decided to drive on the left, that's it. Right? Everybody can see it. It's reasonable. You should do it. Of course, there's some deviation. Yeah, insisting you drive on the left when actually if you don't go onto the right-hand side of the road, you're going to run over a kid is actually ridiculous. So even in rigidly constrained systems, you should always allow for exceptions, uh, something people forget in process improvement exercises. Yeah? Yeah, but in the vast majority of cases, you can apply best practice. We then move on to complicated, where again there's a linear relationship between cause and effect. But fundamentally here, it's not self-evident to everybody so we have to do analysis or we have to bring in expertise, which means we have to trust the experts. And part of the problem with trusting experts is we ask them to make judgments in complex domains where they're always going to get it wrong or they're only going to get it right by accident, so we lose confidence. So one of the other reasons to make the complex complicated distinction is to know when you can trust experts and when you can't in terms of their overall judgment of outcome. Yeah, it's actually about building better trust in many ways. Yeah, so here, I do analysis, I bring in experts, I sense, analyze, respond, and now I have governing constraints, not rigid constraints. Governing constraints means there are degrees of freedom if you have the right expertise and experience. Yeah? Even in this space, over-constraint can produce perverse outcomes. And one of the big problems with consultancy-led initiatives is consultants like to create neat, tidy diagrams. Yeah? And they actually like to force people to select between options. The reality is when you work with experts, and I did a huge amount of work in knowledge management back in the 90s. Yeah. Basically, experts don't know what they know until they need to know it. So interviewing experts and then mandating processes based on what they remember at the time means you get things radically wrong in the future, and again, you're building over constraint. So allowing a degree of freedom is necessary in a complicated space. But again, it's then based on qualification, experience, peer review, 
There's all sorts of checks. The basic point about both ordered domains is you've got effectively an external skeleton. Yeah, within that skeleton, you've got freedom. With rigid order, it becomes very tight. With governing constraint, it's looser, but it's an external constraint. Yeah. With complexity, it's very different. It's now more like the internal skeleton of a mammal than the external skeleton of an insect. And remember, internal skeletons allow huge amounts of variety yeah, and are actually far more adaptable yeah, in terms of individual species, not in terms of overall evolution, but in individual species. So it's kind of like, they're called enabling constraints because they allow e evolution to happen. And one of the key applications of this in Agile, by the way, is the concept of self-organizing teams. If you just allow people to assemble with whoever they want, it's actually chaos. It actually doesn't really produce good results. If you introduce constraints about team organization and team membership, those are called enabling constraints. They provide enough structure that the system will evolve in a favorable way. And again, this is theory informed practice. Once I understand the basis of complexity, I know without constraints, the thing is random. Therefore, I don't get any reliability. So the issue is what type of constraints do I introduce and when do I do them? Don't underestimate the power of constraints. Well, again, anybody with children knows about constraints. Yeah, yeah, the, the issue is you have to you know when to use the constraints. And to be honest, the ones that they don't realize are visible are the most effective. Uh, interesting, in human beings, habit is a more effective constraint than rules. Yeah, and actually building habitual behavior is a more effective intervention than designing rules. But that's for another day. So basically, we then move on from that to a chaotic system. In a chaotic system, we have an absence of constraints, which again, we can do novel practice. So that's the basic Kinevian framework. Yeah. We also have the central domain of disorder, which everybody forgets, which is a state of not knowing which of the systems you're in. It's not the same thing as chaos, because actually in disorder, you could be ordered, you just don't know it. Right? Some of the effects may be the same, because disorder and chaos are always transitionary in Kinevin. The only stable states are obvious, complicated, and complex. So using it as a categorization model makes a mistake. And I've seen some major errors on this. People say, my method is complex, yours is complicated. Some scrum people are very prone to this. You know, scrum is complex, therefore it's good. Well, actually, there's nothing good or bad about being complex or complicated. And actually, the great power of scrum is it's a complex to complicated transition device. It actually makes complex things complicated. That's its power. It moves things across the boundary. And the danger is people use the domains to privilege things. You know, you're ordered, therefore I can dismiss you. We've now got a new group, all right, uh, one system's architects amongst them, who are actually saying that chaos is the really valuable space and they can manage it because they're wizards. I, I love that phrase. Right? Um, and everybody in complexes, complexity is now passe. All right? And this desire to privilege different domains is actually very dangerous. All the domains have value. Yeah? And it's the ability to move between them is key. So there are some basic dynamics on Kinevin and people really need to sort of present these as well. Right? This is the basic cadence, the basic dynamic. As things are complex, we see patterns. Patterns emerge. We stabilize the patterns. As we stabilize them, yeah, we can actually shift them into the complicated domain. So the basic principle of complexity-based intervention is you start off with multiple parallel safe-to-fail experiments, which is why CRUM, Scrum is not a true complexity technique, because it does one thing in a linear way. This is my force things earlier on in the cycle. And we actually call this a pre-scrum technique within Agile. You do smaller experiments faster yeah, in parallel. I'll talk later about our new work on narrative. If you see a cluster of user narratives, which actually achieve statistical significance, and let's take a technique from XP, you put a pair programming team onto those stories and produce a small prototype. Right? That's a pre-scrum technique. And you can do multiple ones of those in parallel. The ones which gain traction then move into a scrum. So you're moving from the center of the complex domain into the boundary. Once you're in the boundary, then you use scrum to move it across the boundary. Start to get the principle here? Yeah. That dynamic is key. Because actually what you do in a scrum is you iterate and see if it works. Does the user accept it? You're testing if the constraint is replicable. 
So once the constraint starts to produce repeated behavior, you know it's complicated. Now you can scale it in the traditional sense of the word. If actually it doesn't continue to produce repetition, then you need to move it back into the complex. Yeah, so that dynamic between complex and complicated is easy to manage. It's a natural cadence. And you need to work it out what it is for your industry sector. It might be days, it might be weeks, it might be months, it might be years, but it's going to be different. If you don't get that right, you might have to do what's called a shallow dive into chaos. Yeah, that's a radical disruption because you've got negative pattern entrainment. Only a small amount of things go down there. This is actually, again, the big danger with over-codifying methods. It takes 10 or 15 years for any method to consolidate. You don't over-codify until you've done enough experiments. Yeah, and that's why I actually quite like Prince too, because its basis has 10 or about 30, 40 years behind it. So modifying that is actually more effective than trying to start again. Yeah, and I would never thought I'd be advocating Prince too, but life has moved on. Right? Um, so basically, you only put a very small amount of stuff down into the obvious space because anything which goes down there isn't going to need to change again. That's the key principle, all right, over, over a sustainable period. There's actually a new dynamic which is becoming more important in software. Uh, we call this the grazing dynamic. You won't see this in any of the papers yet, uh, which actually says some things stay in the complex permanently, yet they graze order and they graze chaos. And we're now starting to see, you can see this in social computing, but we're starting to see it in object-based architectures, is the ability for a system never to stabilize, but constantly to deliver value. And I haven't got time to go into this. I've given a few lectures on, on complexity approaches to software architecture, but that creates architects, architectures which allow things to remain permanently in the complex domain. Yeah, and actually, small code constantly reassembling with defined input-output gives you huge value there. Now, if anybody wants to know more about that, contact me, because to be honest, that's the future. Yeah, the level and the speed of change in society means we're going to be spending more time in the complex with less opportunities to move into the complicated than traditionally we've had. But our architecture and development methods don't currently permit it, but we're fairly close. The basic metaphor behind all of this, and this is from Gerardo, is that actually with organizations, we're dealing with bramble bushes in a thicket or a mango, mangrove swamp, if you want something which is more local. Yeah, you know there are separate plants, but you can't see how they're distinct. Everything is entangled. Everything is connected. You pull one thing, unexpected things happen. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, well, that's actually where we are with software code at the moment. Yeah, that's why neat, tidy structures don't work. You're dealing with bramble bushes in a thicket. You've got legacy systems, unstated requirements, constant change. Everything you do affects everything else, all right? You're in bramble bushes in the thicket. That's the metaphor. It's an ecological metaphor. It's not an engineering metaphor, right? which actually is key because if you switch software to an uh, ecological concept, it's very different from an engineering diagram. Uh, and that, that's kind of like the big change. So some things to give you a hint at. This is a basic diagram. Um, Diane will recognize this. It's moved on a bit since this first version. This is starting to think about project management from a complexity perspective. So on the bottom line, we have waterfall development. Yeah, there's a huge bounce of a large software project where everybody knows what they've got to do, and they should just go and do it. Right? So that's waterfall at the bottom. We then move into complicated. Um, that tends to be scrums or sprints. You've got lots of these working in parallel because you kind of like know what the user wants and you're pretty close to it, yet therefore you're moving across. Then we move into the complex where you're doing multiple small groups of parallel experiments much earlier on in the cycle. Yeah. And then in the chaos, that's an intervention mechanism. So you can see here we're starting to show a time-based pattern in which the multi-experiments feed into scrums but then if the scrum starts to go wrong, let's suppose you go through four or five iterations, yeah, and the user still isn't happy, you trigger it back into the complex. And trying to create a method by which people will do what scrum was originally designed to do, which is sometimes not go through to completion. Yeah, and actually, it's very rare for people to do that. We need that, that greater dynamics. If you get an alert in the obvious space, it moves immediately into crisis management and chaos. So if something goes wrong in complicated, you shift it back to complex. Something goes wrong in, in rigid ordered systems, in the obvious system, it's a crisis because you thought you had complete predictability. 
Again, we're working on this at the moment, but this is a new dynamic visual representation. I'm working also with David Anderson at the moment because we're working on a complexity approach to Kanban, which will be a non-linear representation of progress. Uh, the first course on that is in London shortly because we're going to, to be honest, it's easier to work out a new approach by teaching it. Yeah, so that, that's what's actually going on. We're combining Kanban with complexity and creating new methods of representation complexity. I'll show you one of those in a minute uh, to give you an idea. Now, part of all of this, and I'm going to flip a bit from complexity now and talk about cognitive science. Uh, this is one of the most scary things because if you read this properly, the systems analyst profession needs to collapse and close down. Yeah. Um, there's huge amounts of experiments on this. Yeah. 24 radiologists asked to look for a, effectively a cancer nodule. Yeah, in one of the x-rays, they were shown a gorilla picture, which was 48 times larger than the cancer nodule was present. Yeah, and as it says, 83% didn't see the gorilla, even though their eyes scanned it. Now, now this is scary. The basic facts are the most you will scan of what's in front of you is 3 or 4%. And that's on a good day, 5% at most. You then match it against previous patterns, which are half-remembered patterns of past failure, here directly or here through narrative, and you do a first-fit pattern match. The way we make decisions is we scan stuff through our recent memories, and based on a partial data scan, we associate with those recent memories, and we make decisions. Anybody who conducts any more than three interviews has actually formed a subconscious hypothesis, and they literally only pay attention to things that match that hypothesis. Yeah. Now, that means you can't trust an analyst to go and interview users and have any chance of understanding what they need. Not only that, the users don't know what they need because they've been interviewed in a specific context. Start to see why we get massive failure? Because at the best, we're doing partial scans. Now, in evolutionary terms, this makes a lot of sense. You can't afford to scan everything and make rational decisions. Interestingly, the only people who do that are autistic. And just to scare you, the two university departments with the highest degree of partial autism are computer science and finance. Right? So that has some implications as well, if you think about it, because it's a positive advantage. We, we actually do scan more from an IT perspective than users. And then we assume that users will see things the same way we do, where actually they don't. Yeah, very different perspective. In evolutionary terms, you can imagine it. Think about the early hominoids on the savannas of Africa. Something large and yellow with very sharp teeth runs towards you at high speed. Yeah, do you want to autistically scan all available data? Then look up a catalog of the flora and fauna of the African veld. I haven't identified the lion. Look up best practice case studies on how to deal with lions. Yeah, by that time, the only document of any use to you will be the escape manual from the digestive tract of a large carnivore. <laughs> and the only example I've ever found of that is the book of Jonah in the Old Testament, and I don't recommend building management practice based on that. Yeah. Yeah, we evolved to make decisions very quickly based on recognition of past patterns. So what do you think happens when you launch a new initiative for the IT community? We're going to put you all through training courses. We're going to certify you. How many times have you done that to them before? So what are they filtering it through? You go to users and say, I know we balls up the last five systems, but now it's right because we've adopted a new technique. Don't worry. What are they scanning it through? You're always dealing with people's perception of the past in the present. They will not actually listen to you if you talk about a future. So actually doing small things in the present is actually more effective. That means we've got to look at the world in a very different way. So again, one of the things we focused on is what's called scalable ethnography. Now, this doesn't mean the sort of, it's interesting, a lot of IT people are getting into design thinking, and design thinking has gone from being an artisan process to a manufacturing process. It's now very linear and very expert-based. Uh, Mary Boone and I are currently writing an article attacking it from a, design, from a complexity perspective. Yeah? Um, there's no point in having one expert go out and interview people for the reasons I've just explained. They'll only see what they expect to see. We focused on making people their own ethnographers, mass scalable ethnography. Yeah. So that's kind of like a key principle. Engage people directly. So some basic principles. First of all, the way we make sense of the world is not through grand stories told in workshops. There we're performing. 
Yeah, facilitators bias workshops within 15 minutes, by the way. Yeah, after 15 minutes, the facilitator starts to determine the outcome regardless of people's own views. Again, this is basic 101 science, guys, all right? Learn to live with it. You may not like it, but live with it, right? So basically, the day-to-day -day observations, the water cooler points, the, the minor irritations when you first log on, those are the things that inform people, not grand stories. It's micro-observations, micro-narratives that matter. Secondly, text is very limited. It's about 5% at best of what somebody knows can be written down. That hits big data badly. Yeah, big data, I'm going through the third big data hype in my life. Yeah, it's kind of like one algorithm to rule them all and in the darkness find them. Yeah, and everybody believes, given enough money, they can write the algorithm which will solve the problem to life, the universe, and everything. And there's no point in doing that. We already know it's 42, so let's move on. All right? You either get that one or you don't. All right? um, so basically, all right, mean text is very, very limited. We know more than we can say. We say more than we can write down. Yeah? So from our point of view, we're as much interested in capturing pictures, drawings, and voice as we are in capturing text because that's the day-to-day -day meaning that we need. Yeah. We also need human beings to interpret it, because a machine cannot interpret even text the way the human being who created the text interprets it. Because actually, the, me the text is just part of what the human being knows. They need to add layers to it. Right. So there's, uh, don't get me wrong, there's huge value in big data. It's just overhyped. Yeah, 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 people, it's, it, it's just crazy. I mean, with the Internet of Things, we can do a huge amount of stuff, but we still need human interpretation. The work we're doing on diabetes management and obesity management at the moment involves human beings interpreting their experience. It doesn't involve machines doing it. But because we've got machines, we can actually scale much faster. That's called augmentation, not replacement. Thirdly, human language, if you don't know it, art, cave painting came before language in human evolution. One of the unique things about human language compared with ape languages or Cretaceous languages is it evolved from abstractions, not from naming things. So actually, we're far more comfortable with pictures, lean concept, yeah, or with cartoons, or with metaphors. That's how we explain things. So if you actually want people to give you meaning, you need to work at, a different, at an abstract level, not at a concrete level. People are far more comfortable dealing with abstractions. So, for example, with water engineers at the moment, we're getting them to report micro anomalies. Take a picture and then place it on a triangle between it smells wrong, it tastes wrong, it feels wrong. Now, they love that because it's ambiguous. And they're dealing with ambiguous data. So, we're actually increased the amount of errors reported by over 40 because we've allowed ambiguity of reporting, something we're about to move sideways into soft in test, software testing. If you want to detect weak signals, early signs of failure, you need to recognize that the whole process is deeply ambiguous, and you need to allow people to interpret it in an ambiguous way. So to give an example on this, this is from work we're currently doing on culture mapping. And this is actually by going to everybody in the organization and saying, give an example of a decision made recently which affected you personally, which summarizes what it's like to work for this company. Yeah, not some pseudo-psychological thing. Culture is revealed through decisions as I perceive them. And then people interpret those decisions onto a series of triangles. This is one. Yeah. Where the decision was made by people acting intuitively, interpreting the situation logically, always based on principles. This shows from the beta test, the distribution by division. And you can see this company has got a major problem. It's really good at the analytical side, but it's going to have a real problem in a crisis because the ability to make decisions intuitively doesn't seem to be present. Now, and this is a key aspect of the new method of intervention. Instead of saying, how do I create an XYZ culture, I now click on that model and I say, what can I do to create more stories like this and fewer stories like those? Now, that's a descriptive, not evaluative form of intervention. And it's exactly the same thing we're now doing with user stories. What could I develop which would create more user stories like this and fewer user stories like that? Yeah, and that's the pre-analysis phase of requirements capture. 
by allowing users to continuously record every micro experience or a sample of users, we can then look at statistical clusters in those experiences and sit down as a development team and say, how could I create fewer stories like that, more stories like that? That allows technology capability to interact with unarticulated user needs. By increasing the degree by which we interact or co-evolve technology capability with unarticulated needs, we radically improve the funnel that fits into traditional design processes. I can show you some examples of that in a minute, but basically description is better than evaluation. This is actually an example. This is from one of the US's major manufacturing companies. This is actually measuring attitudes of the workforce. Now, actually, on the horizontal dimension, we have work completion. On the vertical dimension, we have rule compliance. So you can start to see why this company has got a problem. Yeah? In the factory on the left, you either get the job done or you follow the rules. In the factory on the right, you either get the job done or you've given up trying to do either. Now, the transitionary mechanism, this, the traditionally approach, would be to try and move everything to the top right-hand side with a corporate-wide initiative. Familiar with that? We've got a safety problem, big program. We're not doing that anymore. If you look at the right-hand side, you can see a transitionary point. So the factory manager is sitting down with the people on the factory floor and saying, how would we create more stories like that and fewer stories like these? Better than that, each factory manager has their own landscape. And because those landscapes are coming in from observers continuously capturing material, it's actually changing in real time. So each factory manager can now sit down and say, how can we create more like this, fuel like this? You start to see how we do object-based architecture now in systems design. We have multiple real-time representation of a user or consumer space. We're constantly slotting new code and new capability into the system. We're getting real-time feedback, which is statistically measurable. This is a quantitative technique, not a qualitative technique. So we can measure vector, not velocity. And that's actually important. Yeah? Vector, not velocity. Right? Because actually, if things are moving in the right direction, then actually we've succeeded. If we try and define an unachievable endpoint, we are always going to fail. That's why failure rates are so high because we're dealing with complex systems, not ordered systems. In a complex system, you can define direction, but not order. Which leads me finally onto a key concept called acceptation. Uh, dinosaur's feathers evolved. You have to be careful on this in the States. You have to start off by apologizing if any evolutionary is offended, and then saying you have no intention of actually taking them seriously. I quite enjoy doing that one. All right? um, basically, a dinosaur's feathers evolved for warmth or sexual display. Then one day, a dinosaur with a lot of feathers falls off a tree, and it glides, and we get birds. Yeah? In fact, an evolution has relied on what are called nonlinear acceptive moments. It's not adaptation, it's acceptation. We see the same in technology. A Raytheon engineer maintaining a radar machine notices that a chocolate bar melts in their pocket, yet we get microwave ovens. I remember when I was a coder, I often had sudden insights of something I'd done somewhere else I could move sideways. That's called acceptation. So look at this example. On my left, user stories interpreted by the users into six triads. On my right, technical capability techn across silos interpreted into six triads with similar labels, polymorphic, by technical people. I now merge them at a metadata level. This is actually how you handle cross-silo knowledge, cross-transdisciplinary -trans stuff. We can get metadata at the right level of abstraction. This is a whole new approach, by the way, to legacy database management, is we create human metadata structures, and then we use training databases to actually do machine intelligence. By metadata integration, I can integrate radically different databases very, very quickly. And what I also find then are exaptive moments where clusters of user stories link with technology capability. I can now look at that and say why, but I've also got an evidence base to do a prototype. And I can see cases where user stories don't link with technology capabilities or technology capabilities have no link with user stories. This is a dynamic, real-time, continuous feedback system. And that leads me onto my final slide, which relates to scaling. 
So a couple of lessons. Complexity is not scaled by aggregation. A complex system can't be reduced to the sum of its parts. The properties of the whole are different from the properties of the part. So by definition, it's not reductionist and it's not aggregative. Now, this is actually what has upset a few people in SAFE, because I'm not saying it's wrong pragmatically, I'm saying it's wrong a priori. Yeah, you actually can't scale in that way if the system is complex. You might get some approximations because good people will make it work despite itself, but it's wrong in principle, it's not just wrong in practice. So fundamentally, don't worry about the triangle, I'll explain it in a minute. The basic principle about complexity is you reduce the granularity and you allow what's called recombination and partial copying. If you actually look at evolution, it's partial and incomplete copying which produces progress, not exact copying. So by actually breaking things down, allowing small, starting with the core unit, user stories, technology capabilities, and allowing them to recombine in novel ways, that's how you scale. Now on the right hand side, you see an example we've been talking about recently, getting people in strategy to tell stories about things which are keeping them awake at night. Getting users to talk about things which frustrate them. Getting technology to talk about their capabilities. And then you get a three-way acceptation. So I don't scale by aggregating up. I scale by finding new patterns across the whole domain. And that's this kind of like basic principle is we need to engage the real sea level, not the sea level in IT. They're already engaged. It's just a game. You've got to engage the sea level in strategy, in marketing, in customer relationships. And you're not going to do that by IT structures. You're going to do that by finding novel solutions to real world problems and by distributing capture so it's pervasive and non intrusive rather than forcing people into workshops and interview type processes. Engage, it's scaling by engagement, not by aggregation. Learn early, fail less. I made that point earlier. And this point about continuous real-time feedback loops. Now, what I'm trying to take here is an approach to scalability based on science, not based on somebody's perception of practice or need to earn consultancy revenue. And we need to get a natural science approach back into software development. And that's kind of like the argument here. Because actually, at its basics, complexity is really very simple. But it shouldn't be simplistic. If you understand the basic principles, it's very easy to adjust. And there are three fundamental heuristics about complexity management. Reduce the granularity, distribute cognition, and disintermediate decision makers. That means putting decision makers in direct contact with raw material. So coders should have direct contact with user stories. It shouldn't be mediated by analysts. Executives should have direct contact with technology which might make a difference strategically because they didn't even know it was possible. Disintermediation applies at all levels. And that's what scalability is about. It's sometimes called the new simplicity the trouble is, simple things are very easy to grasp when you've allowed the world to become far too complicated. Thank you very much for your time. Are we on? There, now we're on. Okay. So um, I was waiting you for you to use the word culture, and I almost thought you weren't going to use it at some point, which would have been awesome. <laughs> um, because it gets used often in our profession so much, and like, what kind of culture do you need to support agile teams and the corporation? So I'm kind of I would love to hear what culture means in the context you were talking of it from and how people in our okay. profession can practice with it. I have to be very careful here because I encourage my daughter to do anthropology. She's now got an MA in cultural anthropology. And I get, when you get corrected by a 25-year-old daughter, you start to panic. It's, Dad, you need to read this urgently, all right? I'm, I'm using culture in the sense the way we do things around here, which we all understand, but you won't understand until you work with us. Yeah, and culture cannot be engineered. Yeah, you can't define a culture. There is no such thing as an ideal culture. There isn't a recipe for this. Yeah, culture is what it is. And culture is revealed by day-to-day -day stories. Yeah, so if you want to shift a culture, you can't say, I want to get here. You can say, well, I don't like those stories. I like these stories. What can I go and do to make a slight difference? Yeah, so you're managing that sort of direction. That's all you can do. Right? That's the most you can do. Hey, one other quick question. What's a micro-narrative? OK, it's a fragmented observation. 
Um, let me give you an example. We, we did one project uh, with an Air Force. Right? So we were looking at how culture impacted on staff retention. So we pulled in 3,000 stories over a week from officers and spouses of officers. It's actually interesting. Spouses and older children often tell you more about culture than, than the people themselves. Yeah? Now, that was done on a series. I can send you the paper if you want, on a series of triangles based on cultural anthropology, not on organizational design. I don't buy that stuff. We go back to anthropology. So things like attitudes to justice, attitudes to identity. Yeah? From that, we got an absolute correlation yeah, between effectively a, a disposition to leave the Air Force early and recent implementation of Lean Six Sigma. Yeah, we had a multi-choice question about which major initiative is it's associated with. And that didn't surprise me, because anybody who puts Lean together with Six Sigma doesn't understand Lean. I mean, Lean is about eliminating the waste that Six Sigma creates in the first place, but never mind, all right? Um, Six Sigma is BPR with American Bible Belt cultism added on it to it for good measure, right? If you've got a black belt, yeah, you should be treated as a heretic, in my view, right? But never mind. So basically, we get that. And Chief of the Air Force does not like this news. All right? He's really pissed off because that's his pet initiative. So we said, OK, so, and remember, I'm not evaluating. This has come from his own officers. It's his officers interpreting their own stories. So he can't challenge it. So he's paying attention. So he looks at a young officer at the bottom of the table, and he says, we, by which he means you, haven't implemented our, by which he means my, initiative properly. Right? So now he's blaming somebody. And we said, we don't know. Look at the story. So this is the micro-narrative. Uh, it was a non-hypothesis question. It's the key. You don't have a hypothesis when you do narrative work. So the non-hypothesis question was, you're a grandparent, and your grandchild says they want to join the Air Force. What will you tell them? Yeah? First micro-narrative, one-liner. I'll shoot them first, and they'll be grateful. And he said, oh my god. He said, that's some disgruntling officer. So we don't know. Click on the demographics. 30-year warrant officer. Now, at that in the moment, there's just silence around the table. Then he clicked on the second one, two-paragraph story. It says, why do we have to shit under the trees? Yeah? And it's a story of a new Air Force base, which has just been set up. This is actually in the desert. Right? Um, and the new Six Sigma, pro sorry, the Six Sigma process means they haven't got a mobile latrine. So they're having to dig holes in the ground rather than use it. And they're pretty pissed off. They're a month into deployment. Right? Two paragraphs. And I saw the chief of the Air Force get up, go to his desk, and have a quiet, assertive conversation with somebody, which is always scary in military terms. The latrines got flown in yeah, at, almost immediately. But then he came and sat at the table. He said, we've taken Six Sigma too far. Yeah. Now, the point is, it was a small, fragmented anecdotes, not a consultancy-enabled workshop. The process of gathering them meant he couldn't challenge them. And it was descriptive, not evaluative. So by looking at a description, he worked out what to do for himself. Now, that's the radical shift. You move from evaluation to description, from aggregation and summarization into disintermediation and raw data. And to be honest, the culture word is there because people talk about it, but it goes away. If you do the right things, the culture follows. Yeah, yeah, they, they got, people have got it the wrong way around. You don't change the culture to get people to do the right things. You do the right things, and then the culture follows. Does that make sense? Shouldn't ask me interesting questions. Dangerous. That's all right. They're all yours. Uh, hope you guys enjoyed the keynote this morning. I saw a few people kind of send me messages saying this is all bouncers for me. I would say that's actually a very good thing. If it's all bouncers, that basically means you're motivated enough to go back and do some homework and try and understand, because this is a very important perspective I want everyone uh, here to take away, right? So I would take that as a compliment, saying it's all bouncers, it's good. Uh, let's go back, do some homework, and that's going to help all of us, all right? Thanks, Dave. That was a fantastic keynote, as expected.